All right, our third and final speaker for Monday's general session is EGSA member Joe Zernheld. Joe Zernheld is the CEO and strategist for Power Systems Research based in St. Paul, Minnesota. He joined the firm in 2005 and since that time has focused on the power generation related markets, working on projects addressing our industry. After more than 20 years in, in the industry, his experience spans across several technology areas, starting with a tour as an officer in the U.S. Navy and a graduate of the Naval Nuclear Propulsion Program. Following Joe's naval service, he joined Alstom Power and was uh, involved with the gas turbine combined cycle plant commissioning and warranty management services. Got some good news here. Joe's a Golden Domer, received his B.S. in mechanical engineering from the University of Notre Dame and MBA from the University of Texas in Austin. He has been involved with EGSA since 05 and an active member of our community, currently serving as vice chair of the EGSA Market Trends Committee. Nice warm welcome for one of our own, Joe Zernel. Thank you, Charlie, for that very nice introduction. I also just wanted to first say Thank you to EXA for, for asking me to present today on this topic of investor mindset. The findings and thoughts today represent knowledge gained over the course of interacting with industry participants uh, and from our own in-house research projects. As we go through the material today, there will be a bit of detail surrounding the, the market size for on-site power. But uh, we're probably not going to have time to go too far in depth, but we'll certainly hit the high points. And please know that copies of this presentation will be made uh, onto the website, the EXA website, at a later date. So with that, I will get moving through the material. Um, first, just a uh, context footnote. When speaking of power generation today, I'm speaking within the context of the EXA membership's primary of focus, the on-site power industry using reciprocating engines. Additionally, in terms of geography, we're going to consider the global market just for some purpose of uh, context, but the focus will be on North America in terms of trends, drivers, etc. So today's goal, the question is not, is power generation a good investment? I think we all know that it is. We're all here, we're active in the industry. Uh, but rather it's why is power generation uh, a good investment? And then secondly, what sorts of things would that outside investor be looking at to determine that it is a good investment? So today is a chance to, to put on our investor's hat uh, and perhaps view our industry through a different lens. So today's agenda. We're going to review several aspects of the on-site uh, power industry that are most intriguing to the investor. But first, we're going to take a look at what is the investor's mindset? Um, what are they looking for in both uh, looking at the industry and at the company level? So we'll look at market size and scope. How big is the on-site power opportunity? Uh, a SWOT analysis on the industry identification of the key drivers of demand, the impact of the other technologies out there. And then finally, we'll wrap all that up with um, how, how to best position ourselves as EXA member companies going forward. So we'll come away today reinforcing, um, probably reviewing a lot of things that you're already familiar with, uh, but hopefully gain a, new, a few new perspectives that might help position your company and your brand in the best light possible. So some of you may be wondering at this point, that's all great, but really how does this apply to me? So it should apply to, to all EXA members in the following ways. A better understanding of our, our value proposition um, of the on-site power industry in general. And secondly, for each of our companies, what is our value proposition within that market? Uh, it'll create an awareness um, of, our, uh, of the importance of your competitive position in the market. And then finally, what things matter most in the eyes of that investor that's, that's looking at the industry and, and your company. So let's start out with who is the investor? There's really two extremes here. We've got the private company 
uh, a potential partner or individual investor that's looking at investment into a smaller private company. On the other end of the spectrum, we have what could be an institutional investor looking at publicly held companies and evaluating their funds investment into the industry. So thinking in terms of an investor, for a given dollar amount, can they realize their required return on investment within their targeted time horizon? Furthermore, how volatile is the market? Is their money safe? All these things to consider while evaluating other uses of their capital. The question of volatility is an important one, and it's supported by how sustainable the market is in terms of longevity of demand year over year. As we explore some of the detail here, that we'll see that the size and scope of the on-site power opportunity is, is definitely a strong demand, and that is a lasting demand. So big picture, the investor will first consider the industry and ask themselves some of the, the key, they'll first ask what makes this industry intriguing relative to the other industries that they could invest in. At this point, they'll consider some of the basic market questions. Um, some of those will be market concentration. Uh, how many players are there that are leaders, followers, and other maybe small regional type players? Is there a sustainable demand in market performance year over year? Market maturity. Is this a growing industry or is this a relatively, relatively mature, saturated market? Uh, depending in on-site power, depending on the combination of power range, field type, and application, uh, there can be pockets of, of opportunity that, that could be either, either one of these. We'll look, uh, the investor will look at an industry-wide SWOT analysis. We'll review this in, in further detail later. Typical margins. Depending on the level of competitive, competitiveness and scale within the industry, There'll be differences in margin that are there to be made. Investors will want to have some context of the market dynamics that, that go on in the industry in terms of uh, are prices being squeezed by value chain suppliers or by other competitors in the marketplace. They'll want to understand that whole relationship. So moving on to, to the, the company evaluation, similar to the industry, when analyzing a company, investors will have several questions. With a company, they'll take a little more targeted, detailed look. But some of these basics they'll be evaluating, uh, you know, is the market big? Given the company's current products and services, what's the upper end of their profit spectrum? What are the margins? Are the margins consistent with the industry norms? You know, if there's, if they're, if they're higher, that, that's certainly better. Um, they're outperforming the rest of the market. If they're lower, they have some work to do. Management team evaluation. This is, this is an important one. It's, it's probably tough to assess at the time an investor is uh, looking at the company, but right people in the right seats. This is a really important aspect. The, uh, obviously, the management team is the, the, the key, key facet of carrying the vision forward for the company. Can, can you increase market share? Uh, is the company kind of locked into where it is? Maybe there's some larger players that control the market and there's really not a lot of upside for them to improve their market position. Partners and joint ventures. They want to see that the company is not too self-reliant, that they're leveraging what they have into revenue sharing opportunities, um, other uh, types of, of cross-selling relationships. Um, you know, this is an important uh, aspect uh, when looking at a company. Market leader in what area? Uh, and typically, a company will have uh, several areas they participate in, but they'll have one bread and butter area where they, they compete and perform the best. So uh, investors will want to see that there is that, that focus on that core area. Condition of the balance sheet. Cash reserves, existing debt, access to lines of credit, um, these are going to affect what leverage the company has to, to grow when they need to grow and, and really the health of the business. Research and development. Are efforts being made towards new product development, reinvesting into the business to maintain their competitive position 
and changes the market changes around them. And then finally, are products uh, scalable um, or off the shelf? Uh, within on-site power, we see off the shelf solutions, we see customized solutions and some combination of both. If a company is in, in the off the shelf sort of space, invest, investors will wanna see that uh, that company is, is built to scale and they can react to surges in demand um, in terms of production capacity, processes, and if they don't currently have that in place, do they have uh, a plan to, to be able to react um, you know, to that demand? So now that we've considered some of the basic questions that the investor will be asking, let's consider the size and scope of the engine-based power gen markets worldwide. It's a side point here related to what I mentioned earlier. Uh, some of the detail in these, these tables and graphs that follow uh, might be difficult to pick out some of the key, key points, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna cover the high points, and like I said, this presentation will be available later. So we'll be looking today from a production viewpoint in terms of total production of gen sets uh, by total units, total megawatts, and the factory value of that production. Looking at the global overview, we see that the global diesel and gas gen sets is over 1.3 million units produced per year. Even with the more aggressive growth we've seen in natural gas over the last several years, um, natural gas is still a pretty small basis at 200,000 plus units a year out of the 1.3 million units. Gas made up about 17.4% of production in 2015 and will grow to a share of about 19.4% five years out in 2021. So here we're looking at the, that same global production from the standpoint of total megawatts. The total engine uh, Genset based megawatts per year is in the range of 127,000 megawatts or 127 gigawatts. Of this 127 gigawatts, about 88% is diesel and 12% is natural gas. In terms of growth rates, we see that uh, gas has the upper edge at about 3.9% versus 1.9% for diesel. On the right hand side of your screen, you see the, the standby um, megawatts in blue, the uh, prime power megawatts in orange, and it's about a 55% share for standby megawatts to 45% uh, prime power. So next, we're, we're looking at factory value of production for global gensets. Uh, the total estimated factory value uh, worldwide it was over $17 billion in 2015. Of that $17 billion, $4.2 billion was gas, $13.3 billion was diesel. Looking out five years, we see an annual growth rate of about 3.9% overall, reaching over $21 billion in 2021. So the main idea here is just to, to before looking at the regional picture, is just to get some context of the size of the, the global uh, genset opportunity. So looking at that split globally, North America versus rest of the world, North America accounts for over 300,000 units per year of diesel and gas uh, out of the 1.3 million, or about 25% of total production per year. And please note, similar to looking at the global totals, we're looking at um, we're gonna be looking at uh, uh, production for North America. The actual consumption, so therefore the, uh, there's 300,000 produced in North America. The actual consumption in North America will be something less because of net, net exports out of, out of North America. So North America genset unit production by power range and fuel type. So, here I just want to point out the, the, the key things here on your right side, the, the red circle and the black circle. So the red circle is um, where the, the, the units are clustered in the 5 to 250 kilowatt range. 
represented by the bar graphs. That's where we see the bulk of the production volume. In contrast, the bulk of the megawatts, megawatts is plotted on the line graph here. Bulk of the megawatts is in that greater than 50 kW range. We can see here uh, on our left-hand side the megawatts. This is megawatts by power range. You can see greater than 50. So it's kind of a, an inverse relationship there between units and, and megawatts. And that, we'll see how that corresponds to market value in a few minutes. Looking in more detail at the, the megawatts uh, for North America, we can see that 87% of North America's megawatts are in the ranges greater than 50 kilowatts, what I just covered. Uh, we'll see later that this represents the majority of that market value. In terms of diesel versus gas in North America, megawatt-wise, we see a three-to-one ratio diesel to gas. And then finally, on the right-hand side, similar to the global overview, uh, we see that the standby market uh, in blue is 14.5 uh, gigawatts out of the 26 gigawatts in 2015. It's for standby, the rest for prime. So finally, factory value of gensets in North America. It's estimated to be at over $4.8 billion in 2016 growing to over 5.7 billion in 2021. In contrast to megawatts, where I just mentioned we had the three to one diesel to gas relationship, uh, in terms of the factory value, we see the diesel representing $3 billion compared to uh, gas representing $1.7 billion. So that ratio is now 1.8 to one diesel to gas. So, I think what we're seeing there is the higher first cost of, of the gas gen set um, bringing that ratio down when you look at megawatts versus value. Um, notice also gas has the higher growth rate over the term of the forecast at uh, 5% over the next five years versus diesel 2.1%. This represents a greater penetration of, of gas, I think, which is pretty obvious into prime, prime power applications, but also into standby applications where gas is a suitable substitute for diesel. So now that we have some perspective in terms of the uh, total market size and scope, we'll look at a SWOT analysis on the industry. So first, re renewables like wind and solar, there's been a lot of uh, interest over the years. One common drawback, though, is they're, they're they're intermittent type of resources. If the, if the wind isn't uh, um, as planned or the sun isn't, isn't shining as planned, those uh, resources are limited capacity. With engine-based power, the power is always there. Along those same lines, uh, engine power has excellent, excellent power density on short time demand. Uh, fuels are available, diesel, Diesel's available everywhere. Um, gas is in most places in North America where the demand uh, sort of dictates there's gas available. Um, established brand names. Um, brand names are important in many applications in North America. Generally, this means some inherent protection from uh, brands that are, are less familiar. Finally, the Genset product itself, that's only to get your foot in the door. There's many other aspects of the, the value proposition that customers in North America have come to expect. Things like uh, distribution channels, service, and support. These things certainly don't happen overnight and they are a barrier to uh, competition. So the weaknesses. Unfortunately, we do need to talk about the weaknesses just at least for a little bit here. Uh, the more stringent that emissions compliance standards become in the future, the more costs will be passed along to the end users. As a result, end users may look for alternative solutions. We all know that engine-based power is a clean solution. It certainly has made many strides uh, over the last 10 years with emissions um, compliance. But there's still a potential stigma attached to any combustion process and um, 
outsiders may not view engines as a true green technology. Engine-based power is vulnerable to price pressures uh, from cheaper imports. We see this at the lower K KW end of the spectrum. And then finally, relative to other industries available to the investor, there may be other industries. Um, the, the barriers to entry in on-site power may be lower relative to other industries that investor is looking at. Opportunities. Engines play well with other technologies. Um, it certainly ben benefits engines for microgrids. Uh, we live in a data-driven culture. Data backups, consumer and business for data centers and other uh, in-house systems are only going to increase in the future. Engine-driven technology is improving, um, meaning increased fuel efficiencies. Many of the improvements that we typically start seeing in the on-highway um, segment, you know, such as turbocharging, fuel injection, etc. Those things trickle down into the genset space, uh, normally at a re much reduced cost um, to the end user after the um, technology is established. Overall systems efficiencies, this is a big focus, reducing carbon footprint in corporations, municipalities, other organizations. Uh, this is uh, I think this is certainly um, improves the outlook for CHP. Uh, when you look at CHP penetration rates of where CHP systems might be suitable to be installed, there's a lot of progress to be made. And I'd say this is uh, one big window of opportunity for engine-based power. So threats. This one's pretty simple. Uh, disruptive technologies is the main thing. Um, and with that, we're talking about some sort of game changer, likely in energy storage solutions that'll come along. Uh, the point is arguable as to the, the, media, the short term and medium term effects. We know that any disruptive technology, uh, it takes time for it to gain some traction and market share. You know, just look at, uh, for example, the, the hurdles that the electric vehicles have, have faced um, in getting widespread adoption there. Uh, combined costs of emissions and fuel costs. These could rise more quickly than the end user is willing to pay. You know, we've seen with the uh, natural gas, you know, the prices falling there, how that pushes that uh, decision between diesel and gas. I mean, same type thing with uh, just engine-based technology in general. Um, if those costs uh, uh, quickly rise, people might be looking towards other alternative technologies. All right, uh, next we'll look at some of the, the key demand drivers. But before touching on those, I'd like to cover the demand drivers, uh, how we see the demand drivers. It's helpful to distinguish the different types of drivers. And you can quickly see that the yearly demand patterns can be characterized into what I have here is, is three different layers. And first, I'll start with the, uh, the core demand in blue. So core demand is, is the underlying demand that'll exist each year. It's that demand that's there due to new installs and replacement that is there due to the sheer size of the market. Uh, these purchasers are, are not on the fence. Base demand. Base demand is represented in the orange, the middle layer. These are more predictable than variable, which we'll get to in a minute. But the, the base demand is tied to the overall health of the economy and the key influencers. Base demand influencers will not substantially swing the market up or down in any given year. Um, it includes, the influencers include things such as the interest rates, construction spending, government spending, oil and gas activity, and, uh, and the overall economic cycle of uh, recession or expansion. Finally, variable demand is, is the wild card in all this, and that's represented on the top in the, in the gray. Um, these are the situational influences on demand year to year. Outages caused by hurricanes, ice storms, tornadoes. Um, as, as we get increased, an increased frequency of outages um, you know, in, in, in frequency and severity, 
This will cause that user to shift towards the purchase decision. So think of base demand as the sorts of uh, conditions that will get those fence sitters to move towards that purchase decision. Think of the variable demand is normally the uh, short-term larger impact demands. So with that in place, we'll look at the uh, out electrical outages driver. And we can see here from our, our two-year moving average that uh, um, it's definitely trending up. It's not, uh, it's not any secret. Um, each event seems to get more coverage these days in the media. Uh, awareness is really up. Expectations are high. Downtime due to electrical outages are, are more unacceptable today than ever before. As, as we see the increased frequency and severity of, of these sorts of outages, this, this will cause the user to shift their uh, purchase decision. So next, uh, each quarter we contact over 900 businesses and 300 consumers in our uh, Power Tracker survey. During these interviews, we ask end users to rate their concern about the reliability of their, their electricity supply and rate it on a scale from one to seven, where seven is most concerned, one is not concerned. Although those that rated their concern as either a six or seven, we group into concerned and very concerned. Um, this index is what I like to call the anxiety index. Although these anxieties do spike with each major event, you can see that in the trend of the, the graph um, against the, the milestone events, uh, it's interesting to note that, that the, the peak of the trends is lessening over time. You can see this arrow down to the right. The, the width of the concerned and very concerned is lessening over time, over about the last 10 years. Uh, this may suggest a general sentiment that those that were in that, that kind of upper echelon category have been proactive over the last 10 years um, as awareness has been brought to this and have installed backup systems and taken action. So I'm not saying here there aren't um, concerned people out there, but, but what I am saying is that the concerns about the, the reliability of electricity supply, electricity supply um, seems to have, uh, is not quite as uh, intense and, and severe as it was 10 years ago. So impacts of other technologies on, on RESIPs. Uh, there's other technologies out there that are con going to continue to compete with engine-based power. Obviously, buzzwords like microgrid and distributed generation are growing in importance. If we look at our panel on microgrids at our spring conference in San Antonio, as well as our uh, uh, sessions here in Sacramento, these are supporting evidence that uh, these concepts are only growing in importance. So considering this, we'll look at other technologies. There, there's sort of two possibilities that, that we're looking at here. Um, these other technologies will have a displacement effect that's a direct competition where it's competing head-to-head -head for that engine-based business. There's more of a complementary effect, uh, which we're probably more likely to see, is where there's increased opportunities for, for engine-based power to participate in in a microgrid type setup. So there may be more opportunities there, maybe less gen, gen sets per opportunity is a, is a difference. So there's kind of a combination of that uh, displacement and complementary effect. The key here is, is flexibility to adapt um, in, in the future to where the opportunity is and, and change uh, our mindsets around that. In some respects, this may be uh, somewhat of a paradigm shift uh, in terms of how we envision and think of the future of engine-based power in the on-site power industry. So what I mentioned earlier is that we wanted to work back around to how does this apply to me? So items like company mission and vision statement, are they consistent with succeeding in today's market environment? 
the value, if these things are in order, the value proposition should be made clear and should support the vision. The vision where the company wants to go um, in the short, uh, medium, and long term. And then finally, this is the big one, have the right organization. Right people, right products, and right processes. Um, these things sound uh, uh, probably strategic in nature, rather abstract, but uh, um, it's certainly, if, if an from an investor's standpoint, they're gonna be looking at things where they'll be able to see if all these things are in place and, and organized the, excuse me, the, the right way. And we'll look at uh, some more tangible things here on the next slide. So how does your ideal position fit together? When looking at sort of the, the puzzle of the, the business, there are some, these are some of the more tactical and tangible types of, of things in contrast to some of the more strategic items we just reviewed. So the combination of all these together will shape how that investor is looking at the business. I won't cover all these in any, any detail. Uh, there's probably things that you already have in your, your sites already, but perhaps uh, it's worth doing a, a conscious review and evaluation of, of some of these others. So some of the key items include assessing growth potential of the company. Is there room to grow your revenue to your goals given where you play now? Or is there some adjustment needed? Differentiation of your products and services. Um, how differentiated are you to the next, next competitor? Supply chain control. Um, what side of controls do you have on, on purchasing and, and uh, um, you know, cutting costs? Distribution strategy, uh, margins, are you within the industry norm? Um, is there any way to improve your margin? If you can improve one point or half a point, that can have a substantial impact on, on your profitability. Um, and then finally, consumer loyalty. That's a, that's a very important one, is the level of stickiness of your, your customers. Do you give them a reason to come back and purchase from you the next time they're going to purchase? So today, we've, we've covered a lot of territory. Uh, I know I've, I've thrown a lot out there. Hopefully this has uh, come together to provide some context of how an investor uh, might be looking at our industry and, and what sorts of items they'd be evaluating. So in, in conclusion, the question we set out to answer initially is, why is this industry a good investment in the eyes of the investor? I'm going to bring this full circle and cover some of these uh, overarching and most intriguing aspects of the industry. So first is just cyclical but sustainable. Uh, On-site power fulfills a real basic need in electricity. Everybody needs electricity. That concept of demand layering. There's a base level of demand even through the cycles. Um, that's a real, uh, I think, strong and attractive attribute of on-site power. Along those same lines, variable demand is an attractive market attribute. It has a real upside uh, volatility that can drive profits higher in any given year, uh, and it's tied to Mother Nature. Um, On-site power is one of the, the few industries and unique in that regard that it, it's, it can be fairly profitable um, in times of uh, crisis. Uh, that being said, uh, proper market planning. Um, that uh, things need to be organized to capitalize and on those demand surges. It's not uh, obviously show up in, in supply of power. So there's there's a lot of logistics and, and planning, distribution um, planning that goes into that. So see, so these are some of the main reasons. But really, everything I've covered here today, it's safe to conclude that the, the on-site power industry holds some very unique qualities and, and sustainability that definitely makes it an attractive type of investment opportunity. So with that, I, I thank you for, for listening and I'm open to any questions that you have. I had a question about some of your uh, projections. Uh, you said, you know, on average, 5.2% growth for, for gas units over that next five years, 2.1% for diesel. 
19% over the next five years for gas units. My question for you is, you know, taking into consideration the cost of oil right now, when you guys were doing the projections, how, how did that play in? That's a good, good question. Um, you know, there wasn't, we hadn't factored in probably any real appreciable change from kind of where we are now. Um, and even given that change, I think the, uh, I can speak probably more on behalf of North America, I think there is, um, it's probably going to take a lot uh, of like price difference to, ha to see that come back into balance where it changes that projection significantly. And I'm speaking more on North America um, on that. I hope that answers your question okay. Yes, in, in the back there, yep. Uh, trying to reconcile what you're saying with reading, you know, diesel progress or whatever and seeing that this company's cutting back production and this other company's cutting back and, yeah. you know, the big players on the front. What, what do you attribute to the fact that the industry itself seems to have a more pessimistic view of its future than you do? <laughs> Well, that, that's that's a good. Uh, uh, well, I wouldn't say that that, and I guess I don't know exactly what uh, you know Power Ranger feel you're looking at, but I wouldn't say that, you know, when you look at the whole industry um, in general, um, like for North America, I think the growth rate for diesel was 1.9 percent over the next five years. I mean, that's that's not a, um, I don't think an overly optimistic view. Um, you know, if we drill down into looking at 2016 and 2017, you know, I, I think uh, if we go back to those numbers, that it's it is a little more pessimistic view. I mean, we see things slowing down. We see, you know, there's got to be a down cycle here coming uh, later 2017 to 2018. You know, we see that every seven to ten years or so. So, so it it is in there, but but I. I do see, um, I think you just have to drill down into the, the detail a little more to see some of those, those trends. But I, I, can, I can see where, where you're hearing uh, everything's slowing down. You see a, a, that's a compound annual growth rate over the, the five years. What's a, uh, some of the key aspects for a company in this industry, how they can position themselves? That's a very good question. Uh, you know, I, I'd say probably the, the value proposition aspect. Um, you know, how is the value proposition, um, go back here, uh, how we can position ourselves. How is the, uh, the second point there how is our value proposition? Uh, value proposition is, is clear in that it supports that, that vision statement of where the company wants to go. Those things need to be working to support each other. Obviously, what you're out there selling and, and to customers needs to, to you know, um, agree with your, your strategy and where you want to go. Uh, second part of that would be that uh, um, probably in positioning a company, that third point, having the right organization, the people, processes, and uh, uh, products, you know, all those things. And, and that um, leads to that, that next slide. These are the more tangible, kind of tactical type, types of things. So it's, it's, uh, you know, it's not something that you sit down and assess, um, you know, right away, but it's, it's something that you evaluate over time and kind of, Get, get your house in order, I guess you'd say, and, and, and set up the metrics so you can evaluate them over time and, and kind of like a checkup sort of thing. Yes, thank you. Anyone else? Uh, question? Yes? What are the American numbers? Where does that sit as far as other uh, developed areas of the world and uh, in other countries? Is the U.S. on the lower end scale or the higher end scale? When you look at it at the level we're looking at it, probably very similar. I guess I'm thinking of Europe. You know, is, is uh, uh, looking at diesel markets in 
Europe versus North America, it's going to be very similar. It's going to average out to that. Uh, it's going to probably most likely run closest to the the the, the, uh, the cycle of the economy, you know. So, um, and probably average to somewhere close to a GDP type type level. So, but it is. I mean, it, it's definitely a different outlook. You know, a developed region versus undeveloped. It's a whole different thing as you start kind of peeling back the layers and looking at some of the demand drivers in each of those regions. Did I answer your question? Thank you. Okay. And with that, um, thank you again. And that's it. My time is up. Thank you.